Welcome to another episode of uh, On.NET. Um, today our guest is Richard Keane from Droyant. Hi, Richard. How's it going? Good, good. Uh, and on the show, we also have uh, Rich. Hi, how are you? And Matt. Hello. OK, so today we are going to talk about uh, what Giant is doing with .NET and .NET Core and a few other things, I'm, I'm sure. Um, so Richard, why, why don't you uh, give us a, a quick intro and uh, tell us what you're doing at Giant? Sure. Yeah, uh, I'm an engineer uh, at Joint, so I work on a lot of the APIs and some of the stuff that, that runs our uh, public and private cloud. Um, I previously was at a company called uh, Faithlife. Uh, I was the principal engineer there, um, was responsible for the operations team and a few of the core API teams. Um, and we were a pretty heavy .NET shop um, when I was at that place, so I brought a little bit of that with me to, to Joint. Um, and so we were actually working on, um, you know, an opportunity for them to perhaps run C-sharp on uh, our platform. Um, and that kind of been like a long-term goal of mine for quite a while was was to be able to run C sharp in a performant manner um, on a on a you know Linux based OS or at least something like that. Uh, that's kind of just my favorite flavor to to run you know web apps on. Um, and so we kind of had the opportunity to go that way. Um, started playing around with it uh, more seriously and saw that you guys had open sourced CLR to the point where it could be run and. Kind of, kind of dove in from there. Yeah, uh, I'm sure it, it's going to be a surprise to a lot of our viewers uh, that that Giant would, would be using uh, .NET on its cloud. Uh, I mean, most people probably identify Giant as being the node, the node uh, company. So, uh, why why is .NET interesting to to Giant? Um, I think you know. We're big on containers um, and and container native infrastructure, uh, and having more ways for people to leverage that. Um, there's a huge community, as you guys already know, of of C sharp people that we believe could could leverage um, what we have, which is you know the one of the most um, performant container operating systems that that's around. Um, and and you know reach a, a large audience of people that wouldn't normally be able to to leverage that. Yeah, so Giant is basically a cloud company, mm -hmm. uh, not yep. not just the the node company. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you spent some time working on .NET Core performance, um, and in particular, you worked with with Matt, who is mm -hmm. uh, here with us today. Uh, can you tell us a little bit on about how that went and the, 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 any of the insights that you got from that experience? Yeah, actually, uh, that, that went really well. Um, you guys were a great help and, and worked with us quite a bit. Um, I, I kind of dove in just as a proof of concept and saw your guys' benchmarks and wanted to see, you know, how well it would do on, on our, our flavor of Linux. And noticed that it was quite a bit slower, uh, and and wasn't quite sure what was going on. Um, started diving in, started look, starting using some of the the debugging tools that we have available to us um, on on the Joint platform, which is like Dtrace and MDB and um, KStats, PRStat, etc. Um, and just for the life of me, wasn't seeing anything great, but we, we couldn't get good stack frames, um, being managed language and all, and um, not having the full like tool set that we have for Node. Um, so I, I ran it on VMware and just thought I would check. I'm like, wow, that's really weird. It, it matches their performance exactly. Um, and then I ran it in my test cloud. I have like a, We have a little cloud on a laptop that you can run. And it performed just as good as your guys' results on mine. I'm like, what's going on here? It's, it's really odd. Um, <laughs> and it ended up being a, a function of, of core count on the box. Um, so we expose all the cores to you. Um, even though it's a multi-tenant environment, you're able to burst beyond um, 
whatever you subscribe for. So if you get like a two vCPU container, you can sometimes use um, all 48 cores on a box. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, with the way we can get into the exact issue, but basically with the the way that the thread pool works in .NET, it, it wants to grab all 48 of those, right? Um, and we found a really hot lock um, that, that was exacerbated by the fact that we had 48 cores. Uh, and, and sure enough, if you would have ran it on a 48-core Linux box by itself, you would have you've noticed very, very similar results. Um, so, I mean, we kind of went from there. Uh, with the help of, of Brian Cantrell and, and Patrick Mooney, um, just kind of started dissecting stack frames and trying to, to take them back to um, the underlying um, core CLR code and MVC code. Uh, I had built a like a, a test app um, just for like proof of concept that was like an, a minimum viable MVC site that just kind of responded with whatever number you gave it. Um, based on the route, and that, that was kind of the basis, um, because I wanted to test at least all the way through the stack, not just like the response of, of the web server itself. Um, and we, we, what was it, if I remember right, we stumbled upon a stack frame for, for ICU, and we're like, wait a minute, why is ICU showing up so much? Um, and, and sure enough, kind of stumbled upon some, some uh, culture-sensitive comparisons that um, were rather expensive, um, and that's kind of where we met in the middle with Matt, and him and I were both kind of digging at the code at the same time, and um, saw some places we could optimize. Yeah, and and we had it was it was kind of neat because we had you you were working I think on like the beta eight bits at the time or something, and and there had already been performance improvements we had landed before you'd even started that had helped somewhat, and then um, and, and we sort of knew about those issues, but then uh, your app was actually really, really helpful because it was just great to take it, run it in the debugger. Once you point out that ICU was sort of a, a hot point, it was easy for me to say, okay, let's just break everywhere that we do um, you know, access to ICU, and let's just start looking at what the managed stack frames are when this happens. Um, and it was very quick to point out, oh, here's one little place where we're doing some culture-sensitive work that doesn't need to be, and it was on the core routing function for um, ASP.NET, so every request was going through it um, and, and then causing that lock contention because of some locks uh, ICU is taking internally. So it was easy. Uh, at, once we had the sample app and, and could see under the debugger, oh, here's the managed code that's causing the problem, and we don't need to be doing this work just to submit a PR. It was like a one- or two-line PR um, to, to remove that, get it fixed, and it was a fairly sizable performance increase for number of uh, requests per second. Yeah, that was huge. I don't remember the exact number, but it was it was a big win. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you have your own flavor of Linux. Um, can can you explain uh, why that is and uh, how it differs from I don't know the the the, the distros that people are are using usually. Uh, so it, it really is just their distro. Um, you can you can run Ubuntu, you can run CentOS, uh, fill in the blank. Um, what we provide is basically Linux uh, system call table emulation, uh, and sometimes it's one to one, so I shouldn't necessarily say emulation. But um, the underlying OS itself is actually Smart OS, uh, which is a derivative of Illumos, which is a derivative of Open Solaris. Um, uh, but we provide the full Linux call table for um, the distros. So it, when I say our flavor, it, that's the reason I mean flavor. But realistically, you can run Ubuntu, and we actually have like certified um, canonical images. Uh, you can run CentOS. You can run fill in the blank uh, Linux distro. Okay. Are there any compatibility issues with that? Meaning, um, if you're emulating some higher level operating system and they start doing strange things, uh, they make a bunch of design choices, is it hard for you to emulate that below them? Um, well, thankfully we've solved most of those problems. Um, they do come up from time to time uh, and uh, Patrick and Brian, as I mentioned before, they're kind of uh, the, the key people on that. and. Uh, they solve those really quickly. So every once in a while we run into something small, some like esoteric usage of some random Linux command that you know we didn't see coming, but those are really, really few and far between anymore. Mm. Makes sense. Yeah. 
Okay. Actually, um, you and I talked about this a tiny bit. Can you tell us, um, you know, so containers are obviously becoming popular in the, the Linux world, and they're actually starting to migrate to Windows as well. Yeah. Uh, it, it sounded to me like the, the, what you guys offer with containers is actually different than what you would get with containers on, on Linux, uh, regular Linux. Yeah, for sure. Um, containers on Triton, our, our cloud platform, are not uh, hardware virtualization. They're OS virtualization. So you don't have the, the, the model, you know, like the huge hypervisor penalty. Um, it's a really, really thin layer between you and the, and the underlying bare metal. Um, so that's, that's pretty huge. Um, and it's the only way to do that that, that I'm aware of. Um, in a secure fashion, whereas a lot of like LXC and other things haven't actually been certified to run um, securely multi-tenant um, in a cloud area, our stuff has. And that's kind of a huge win uh, to be able to take away um, that, that call stack that you'd have to go through <laughs> with a uh, hardware virtualization. So th that sounds valuable to me. Um... Uh, there seems to be a lot of steam, though, I guess, on the just um, plain vanilla, vanilla type of container. So is it that people just haven't kind of realized that there's another model? Or, um, yeah. yeah. I think that's our biggest challenge, just getting our name out there and so people are aware of what we're doing. Um, I think th on that same light, I should probably mention, um, we support the full Docker Sweet, like you can. Well, I shouldn't say full. We support a giant set of of Docker, um, and one of the cool things about our platform is actually that uh, every data center is like one Docker host. Whereas, like in a traditional setup where you're doing hardware virtualization, each hardware virtual machine has a Docker daemon, and then you run containers inside that hard hardware virtual machine, and you've kind of got a okay, how big is my hypervisor going to be, and then how many containers can I put in it? We've taken that problem away, and an entire data center becomes your Docker host. Um, and so that's it, it's that's a pretty huge win, um, and it kind of helps people relate to to what we're we're doing and you know some of the popularity around that. Yeah, it sounds it reminds me of the difference between um, logical disk managers and having to worry about disk partitions. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, it's a nice abstraction that way. Absolutely. Makes sense. Um, let's see. Uh, so I had I made a list of questions actually. So um, are you doing this just because uh, all the cool kids are doing .NET these days, or do you actually have a customer that's kind of asking you to prove out uh, .NET on on your uh, on Triton? Yeah. So we we definitely have a customer. Um, the, my my previous employer actually. Um, who, who's headed that direction, and, and we wanted to make sure that that would be a viable direction for them. Um, and that was, that was the business case for why we were working on it. Um, me, personally, I, I am a fan of, of C Sharp. Uh, I, I do like working on that, and I've, like, for had, for, like, a few years now, I've had this dream where, uh, you know, traditional Windows C Sharp developers, ASP.NET developers could work on their Windows boxes, develop in Visual Studio. I don't think anyone's going to argue that that's the best way to do that. And then be able to deploy to, um, you know, a, a Linux server or, or a Triton container or whatever and have, like, the operations folk, which might be in a totally different camp or, you know, if you're more DevOps integrated or whatever, it might be entirely that direction, be able to do the same thing on, on the best platform to write it and then bring it over to you know, the, the flavor of that, that you run in production. Um, so, you know, those kind of competing things. I, I, that's what, that last part is what kind of excited my, my weekend research into it, but the business case is definitely we do have um, a customer and, and lots of people lining up, actually. Cool. Um, so uh, you learned about um, the new... .NET Core open source community that we have going on GitHub. Mm -hmm. uh, what what did you find there? Like, is there anything surprising about how Microsoft is doing open source, um, or what you expected? 
Um, I mean, from the from the open source repo and community side, it's what I would expect. I mean, there's there's plenty of engagement. Uh, the the Gitter channel has lots of people going. Um, you know, I mean, the you guys' code is relatively well commented, and I can follow through it. Like that was one. Of, some of the nice stuff was actually like digging into um, the the lower level bits in Core CLR, where there's like page long block comments explaining exactly what's going on and it feels like home like we have a lot of that in, in our code base too um, so that was kind of that was really cool and then I think the most surprising thing was just how eager you guys were to to jump in and work with us and how fast we solved that that was that would be the one thing that surprised me is like okay I mean I, I get I get that we're open source and we're embracing the community that's that's kind of the thing. Um, but to go from a weekend project to bam, solved it, huge performance win between, you know, the the joint Microsoft partnership there. That was that was surprising. That was cool. Although it was it was because we were all in Washington, right? Yeah, maybe. Well, I mean, uh, actually, uh, uh, Brian's in San Francisco and Patrick's in Minnesota. <laughs> yeah, I, I, was, I was joking. Uh, well, all those comments are from Matt. Oh, oh yeah, certainly, most certainly. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we should get talking about the more low-level parts of the product again. Um, so here's a question that relates more to the work you did with Matt, which is um, uh, how much more work do you think we need to do to make .NET Core prime time with performance on Linux um, relative to what you saw and relative to what you've seen with other platforms? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dance around that one a little bit. Uh, I would say that already it's it's hit a pretty good benchmark. Um, I was I was able to honestly say that you could deploy a Node app and a C Sharp app, Sharp app on our platform side by side and get um, relatively the same performance, if not slightly better. Of course, you are um, depending on how you deployed it. Um, that's that's kind of, there's a little bit of cheat because you guys are using multiple threads on a given box, um, whereas you're only going to get one. Um, thread w with Node, and so I didn't actually like deploy 48 Node apps. Um, so from from that perspective, I, I think it's 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 from a performance standpoint, it's getting really good. Um, some of the the CLI tooling uh, is nice. It kind of emulates what a lot of the the more Starnix um, tooling has done, you know, with with NuGet and um, DNU and DNX and all that. Uh, I, I found that really nice, and actually. Um, one of the, the the guys I work with was was asking about, hey, how do how would we swap in Core CLR into um, our uh, what is it? Uh, our I forget what it's called. We have we have basically have an automated service discovery thing that blueprint that we're working on. So that that was pretty nice. Um, I think from a debugging standpoint, there's a lot to be desired still. Um, we have a lot of, of really cool tools. On, on Triton, and one of the things we did with Node.js is build a, a stack helper and an MDB um, plugin that we can actually get the managed call stack from core dumps or core samples um, live, and, and closing that gap and being able to do the same thing um, for core CLR would, would, would be huge. Makes sense. So I will say that um, w when we did the performance investigation, we didn't have a bunch of those tools. We have been bringing uh, some of them online now. We have a tool called PerfCollect that will work. Um, it basically, it does sampling and um, creates a file that can be used in PerfView, which is our Windows uh, performance tool and we'll actually reconstruct managed stacks so you can see hotspots not only in the native code but also uh, you know where where is uh, time being spent in managed code and then we've done some integration with the Linux perf tool uh, again so it can recover information about managed stacks uh, so you can collect a trace on Linux um, and then view it in the perf tool um, obviously there's there's still more work that we want to be doing but it is nice to see this stuff starting to come online um, and then also uh, as I mentioned, that that event viewer tool, uh, sorry, uh, Perfview, um, that's the same tool we use on Windows for uh, diagnosing Windows performance issues. So it's nice to be able to take a trace that was produced either on Windows or Linux um, and investigate it using the same techniques that if you've done performance investigations on Windows, you'll be familiar with. 
Nice. Yeah. Um, it looked like you guys were doing, I want to say it was, I forget the exact debugging tool on Linux, like LLDB or something. Um, I'm curious if, if there's any collaboration we could do to kind of get that hooked into MDB, um, which is a similar type of thing like Perfure and, and, and whatnot. But we actually, when we run node apps in Triton, we generally say abort on uncon exception, and that generates a core file, and we can actually pull up the whole heap mm -hmm. and, and walk the entire heap and print out the managed stack and find memory leaks and stuff that way. And I'm... I'm I started down the path of, of looking at that and, and seeing what it would take to leverage the work you've already done to help um, MDB, but I don't know, crazy idea. No, that, that sounds something like that would be really cool to explore. Yeah, so the, the, the LLDB thing we have, we have a plugin called SOS, which is uh, the name of something we have on Windows for the Windows uh, low-level debuggers, WinDBG and CDB. Um, and basically, it lets you explore internals of the runtime, so it knows how to, given a pointer to a method table, which is like our definition of a, a V table, it can dump out all the methods in it. It can, you know, say um, information about, uh, you know, where, where was this class loaded from. Um, we also have ways uh, we can use it to, you know, walk the GC heap and look for types. Uh, we can use it to set up breakpoints. We can use it to set up, um, uh, it, it also to do uh, uh, stack traces of see all the managed stack frames on the stack. So it is something that's been really helpful um, for doing that low-level debugging not only for like these performance investigations or postmortem debugging, but as we've been waiting for um, VS and VS Code debugging support to come online, it's nice to have this sort of low-level, um, you know, hatchet that you can use to try to tame the dragons uh, when you find yeah, them. Yeah, so. absolutely. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, uh, I got a question, which is, um, you've had experience with uh, both Node and .NET. Uh, do you think that there are some workloads that might work better on .NET than Node, and also vice versa? Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of it has to do with programmer style, too. Um, you know, anything that's, that's going to be blocking on I.O., Node is pretty good about, you know, keeping itself busy doing other things and, and, and not, not getting blocked. Um, so, heavy I/O workloads would probably favor Node. Um, you know, if you're going to be doing, and that's a that's a really complicated question. Um, well, how about we talk about the the blocking I/O for a moment? I mean, you must be familiar with the async model that yeah. we have in in .NET. Mm -hmm. um, so it certainly has a nice usability component to it for the developer. Um, do you feel like it, it um, doesn't have quite as good an implementation behind it in terms of actually quickly um, yielding um, to, the, to uh, the main thread so that you, you can go on doing something else? Um, if I'm being honest, like, it's, it's more of an ignorance standpoint for, for me on that one. I am aware of the async and await stuff that went in. Um, and a lot of my time started going to, to other things when that came out. I, I, I started my C-sharp development in 1.1, 1 1, so uh, <laughs> I, some of those things are still kind of new to me. Um, but, yeah, I, I think that async is first class in Node, so that does come a little more naturally, um, whereas you're kind of mixing styles with C-sharp. Um, but I, I, that's neither good nor bad. I, that's that's purely based on ignorance. <laughs> what, what do you mean by mixing styles? Um, well, you you think in a more synchronous manner when you're writing C sharp code. Um, you, you're not you're not worried about each line's going to execute in and of itself, right? Whereas in Node, everything's going to fire all at once, um, and you can have things that that don't block at all uh, and have problems like opening a socket and closing the socket on the same tick um, <laughs> because you didn't think that you needed to have a callback and block, right? Whereas with C-sharp, you open up a socket, you do something, and then you close that socket, it's going to happen in that, in that order. If you do that in Node without blocking, you'll open the socket, you'll try to send something, but it'll all have already closed. Um, 
Yeah, I, I would add to that that uh, when you look at the, the APIs in .NET, the async version has async at the end of it, whereas in Node, it's the default. The default uh, API has a callback, right? Uh, so uh, in C Sharp, you kind of, uh, we kind of try to express asynchronous code as synchronous code which is a different frame of mind. It actually affects how you build stuff. stuff. And another thing is that when you build an async application, uh, async is one of those things that bleeds up your, your stack. Um, and if you try to add asynchronicity after you've, you've started architecting the application, it's actually the, the kind of uh, decision that will uh, propagate throughout your application. Uh, and, and in Node, Everything is async by default. Your your main loop is async. When you create a new project, it is async. So mm -hmm. it does affect the, the way you build stuff. For sure. Yeah, and, and I mean, it could be programmer style, and it could be what you're trying to accomplish that matters. I mean, whereas you guys have done, you know, added the async keyword and async methodologies, we've kind of gone the other way and built, like, synchronous methods that you can put in. Um, like VA sync and the waterfall and pipeline methods, etc., where you have to explicitly make something, um, you know, pipelined rather than than asynchronous. So it, it's super subjective, and it really depends on the application. Um, there, there's plus and minus to all of it. <laughs> uh, makes sense. Some questions uh, from the audience, actually. Uh, so how about we we take one of those? Sure. Uh, unless you you have a follow up on this, that uh... I don't. Okay. Um, so Happy Hanu is asking: Is there a plan uh, to come up with a video blog on how Node uses the libuv lib in detail? Uh, he says he or she says uh, I was an in, uh, an electrical engineer until recently. Turned to C sharp, ASP.NET, MVC, and Node. Uh, would be useful for people like me. So I don't know about the specific video blog thing, but uh, the, the the part about uh, how Node using LibUV. Uh... Uh, yeah, so I I don't know that there's any plan of a, a video blog for that, but I do know we have you know tons of documentation on the Node framework and how all that's used at joint.com. Um, I can try and pull up the exact link, um, and I'm I'm. Sure, we go into great detail. Um, yeah, sorry, that doesn't fully answer the if question. If you have no, that, that that's great. If you have links that we can put in the description uh, about that, uh, we we can absolutely do that. Yeah, uh, I would I would start with joint.com/developers, and you can find tons of of information about how we use Node, how our infrastructure is. Great. Uh, Joao is asking uh, if you see .NET as a new choice in your dev choice, and I'm assuming that that means in internal projects. Um, uh, and uh, he says, uh, for example, um, when you have a new project, do you also consider .NET Core now and not just Node.js? Um, we're just super pragmatic. I mean, there, we don't default to any one thing. I think it's easy for us to default to, to Node.js because we have a lot of expertise there. I mean, but we've we've built out Go APIs and, and to fit in with Docker and, and make all that kind of stuff work. So yeah, I would say that, that Core CLR is, is on the table for sure. Um, there's been some discussion of that and how we could leverage it. Um. Cool. I'm, I'm very glad to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and another one is, are there any plans to, uh, and this is this is a note question, uh, are, are there any plans to implement stuff like uh, memory mapped file I.O. into Node? Uh, I, I'm not the person to talk to the Node ro roadmap. <laughs> um, uh, actually, the, the Node re repo itself, we uh, hand it over to the, to the Linux Foundation, and there's now a Node.js Foundation now. Um, so the the pull requests um, and, and GitHub issues at at uh, Node.js on GitHub would be the best place to check for that stuff. Okay, we are also linked to that. Cool. And that's it for now for audience questions. 
uh, Rich, if you have... Uh... Sure. Um, back to the platform comparison, since I like those so much. Yeah. Um, what do you think uh, .NET Core is missing that some other platforms have? Uh, or, you know, is there anything in particular that you would like to see us change from, uh, from what you've seen so far? You know, my biggest thing would be reducing the amount of ceremony that has to happen to get an app running. Um, I think there's been steps headed that way. Um, that's that's been pretty obvious. But you know, to to get a to get a Node.js app running is like five lines of code, and you've got Hello World responding with a web server. Um, I think steps in that direction for Core CLR would be would be a big win. Um, yeah, I don't think you'll have to convince the three of us of that. I think we uh, we all we all like that kind of idea for sure. Um, let's see. So um, we've been spending time making .NET Core and ASP.NET Core better relative to the Tech Empower benchmarks. Cool. Uh, I, I I assume you're familiar with those benchmarks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you think that they're good and representative and that? Uh, us spending time targeting those is a is good use of time. I, I think it um, as long as we're talking about the ones that I believe where where you run work in with 32 cores in parallel and all that kind of stuff, um, which is actually what we were doing to to benchmark that that I wrote. Um, yes and no. Uh, a lot of those seem to only be testing the web servers stack and not the up stack components that are a little more real world. Um, which is why I actually wrote the, the little MVC test that I did. Um, and so, yes, it's, it's representative that everyone can be on the same playing field at the lowest possible level of the web stack, um, but I think the up stack bits are a little more representative. So, you know, for, like what I did was respond, like have a route that responds with the number that you're given in Node, have a route that responds to the number that you're given in Core CLR, and then see how those those actually respond. I I think that's a bit more representative, but I think it is it is definitely um, worthwhile. Right, so it's, it's, it's one part of mm -hmm. the story is what I, what I hear you saying. Yeah, for sure. I, I think just leveraging that type of testing against more upstack stuff is is what I would advocate for. You're right, um, and that's obviously not unique to to .NET, but to basically anything. Absolutely. Yep. Uh, so actually, um, we've been looking a little bit at um, Electron. Um, there's some uh, folks, actually, both inside the Microsoft and also outside, that have been using it to build. Uh, client apps, and one of the patterns that we've actually been seeing emerge is using JavaScript on the front end and .NET on the back end. Um, so there's actually this library called Edge that its its sole purpose in life is setting up this kind of situation. And um, I believe you can also, uh, uh, Bertrand will correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I believe you can also use it on the server. And um, so I'm wondering, like, do you see a, a place where you actually use Node and .NET together on the server, or do you think that's really a client scenario and you would, it, it would be uh, not the best pattern to merge those together on the server? I mean, in the, the microservices, service-oriented service architecture world that we live in today, I, I don't think that's a stretch at all to mix them. Um, if I were going to write an app that was going to be purely synchronous, and I wanted, to, I would, I would actually rather write that in C sharp than Node, um, because it's just natural to write a synchronous app in in C sharp, um, whereas I would actually have to bolt on a bunch of stuff to do it synchronously in Node. Um, yes, I would, I would say you could totally mix those. Um, I think the example of JavaScript on the front end, C sharp in the back end, like. Other technologies, platforms are already leveraging that today. So yeah, I mean, that, that seems like where we're headed. But that I think that's kind of the beauty of bringing Core CLR to to Linux or Triton or wherever is that you give people that option. They can pick Node for one. They can pick C Sharp for the other. They can, you know, fill in the blank. You know, Ruby over here. So I, I'm I'm all in favor of being able to mix those things. Okay. Cool. Yeah, there are there are actually uh, some interesting benefits in um, 
in, in doing that. Uh, in particular, uh, Steve Sanderson made some uh, interesting uh, stuff running uh, Node on the server in an ASP.NET application using that Edge library. Uh, the idea here being to be able to um, uh, pre-render uh, things that usually render on the client, but on the server, and improving uh, search, engine, search, search engine optimization because of that. And it creates some opportunities for uh, better interaction between the, the uh, client and the server on the, U, on the UI uh, layer. Uh, and uh, you can also have the rest of your application. And you, you mentioned microservices. That that's an excellent example where you would have parts of your application in one technology and parts in in another. Um, so yeah, interesting things to to explore. I'm personally I'm not convinced that it's a, that it's a fantastic use case, but it exists. Mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Um, so what should I do if I have .NET workloads and I'm interested in the value prop that you talked about with Triton? You know, can I be an on-prem type of customer, or do I need to be using the public cloud to, to go with you guys? Uh, e either way. We, we offer both. Actually, the, the customer I was talking about before, they, uh, they're on-prem. So they run their own version of, of Triton. Or actually, they run our version of Triton on their own hardware. Um, so either way works. Um, it's kind of one of the advantages. Uh, makes sense. So can you tell me a little bit about, um, without going into you know a ton of detail, but a little bit about like, uh, you know, do you have some kind of a pricing model? Like would I would I buy a license to to Triton or like how how does that all work if I if I want to use your your tech? Yeah, um, so on the public cloud, it works just like every other public cloud. You, you buy your instances and you pay um, a, a rate uh, based on how much DRAM and disk and CPU. Um, for on-prem, yeah, it's, it's licensed. Um, I, traditionally, I think it's per node, um, and we don't do any cores or anything else like that, but our, our sales guys make all kinds of deals and all kinds of stuff going on, so... <laughs> there's there's lots of options when it comes to on-prem. Um, there's lots of options for for public too, but it's a little more standardized. Uh, makes sense. So you know, assuming that you know, tons of um, folks decide that uh, .NET on Triton is is a good plan. What do you see as the ways that the that the .NET team, you know, folks folks like Matt and Joint can actually work together to make that a um, better experience and also just make .NET run better on, on Triton. I would just advocate for more of what we've already done. Um, being Having that, that partnership where we can email each other and say, hey, this is, this, this is a little slow or this is great, how did we get here? Um, and then adding to the debugging stack, uh, the things that Matt was mentioning earlier in, the, in, this, in this call, uh, those would be great to have on Triton, um, or to or to or at least like be able to leverage the hooks that have put in put into Core CLR that we could put into our stack. Um, I, more of that, I th I think that would actually be a pretty competitive edge for for everyone um, to have you know both sides of the equation playing together on that. I think everyone kind of wins. Makes sense. Do you guys have more uh, questions? I have another question from the audience, which is, uh, so are you using only C-sharp, or do you also look at, at F-sharp, and uh, what are your thoughts in general about F-sharp? Um, you know, I don't have a ton of experience with F-sharp. Uh, most of the, the function, the last time I did any heavy functional work, it was in, uh, what was it, Dr. Scheme and Lisp, so I'll, I'll try not to make any any judgments on, on F-sharp. Uh, I'd it's neat. I know there's a there's an audience for it, um, but that's about all I know. So no customer that you that you know about uh, have expressed uh, a desire to use F Sharp. I I'm unaware. I'm unaware of it. Doesn't mean there's not, but I'm unaware. Uh, I mean, if it's running on Core CLR, we should technically be able to do the same thing, right? So. Sure. Yeah. So switching gears a tiny bit. Um, so we actually have this new editor now, Visual Studio Code, 
mm-hmm. uh, runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux, and is actually does a great job of editing um, both Node code and .NET code. So that that sounds like it'd be perfect for you. Yeah. Uh, have you uh, have you looked at that at all? I did. I opened it up a little bit when we were working on the the perf issue. Um, and and I, I couldn't ditch my, my Visual Studio. I, I actually took the, the time to like install a Windows box and, <laughs> and get Visual Studio going on. But I do I do think that's rather nice. I I've, I do all my Node in in Atom, so I need to I need to go check that out a little bit more. Um, but yeah, they're they're targeting the same um, a very similar use case, obviously. Yeah. And using the same technology underneath. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's yeah, I I think if the if more of the debugging tools and maybe they are and I just don't know are are inside of uh, of that editor that would, VS Code that would be that would be convincing. Yeah, well, you you should definitely try it then because right. yeah, it has integrated debugging for for Node. I think it's a pretty good idea for Node or cool. Editor. Yeah. yeah, Bertrand actually has um, a fair bit of uh, Node experience. We um, uh, hired him away from a startup uh, last year, and he was doing uh, full-time node development. Um, at Not full-time. Not full-time. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> right. So only seventy hours a week. <laughs> yeah. So part-time. Uh, <laughs> another question from the audience. Uh, Robbie is asking, uh, do you have a dedicated physical Windows box? So, so I, I guess that's more about your uh, day-to-day development environment. Uh, I do not. I have a, I have a Windows VM um, that, I, that I run. I have a collection of random <laughs> stuff, but all of it's mostly uh, Triton. Thomas has a funny question. The question is, did I miss the NPM and left pad discussion? Uh, no comment. So, <laughs> yeah, so for, for people who don't know about this, there is a, a big uh, discussion across the whole community about dependencies and what happens if a dependency disappears. And if you're interested in that stuff, uh, uh, the NPM team published an interesting blog post explaining the whole situation and how they dealt with it. Recommended reading really, if you're interested in that. That's why we have NuGet, right? Um. <laughs> yeah, NuGet actually has um, very uh, strict policies on deletion. Yeah. There, yeah. There's no. They they have. They're the only ones that can delete. So I have a question for Matt. Um, yeah, which is uh, what are the what's the performance work that Richard doesn't know about yet? Uh, you know that will be showing up in our RC2 release or or afterwards. Um, yeah, so I think a lot of it has been driven by um, the ASP.NET team. So the ASP.NET team had uh, in in their Tech and Power benchmarks. They also had other uh, benchmarks that they were looking at, including I think benchmarks that did. Uh, sort of more of what Richard was talking about with the the full stack. So going through MVC, going through routing, um, and and that stuff's on GitHub. I think it's like ASP.NET slash performance or or something. Uh, uh, it's, and it, it's benchmarks. Oh, uh, benchmarks. Okay. Um, so th- another thing that uh, in, and so that that's been uh, really helpful. Like there have been a, a lot of great PRs from folks like uh, Ben Adams and others, where it's like, oh, here's some like loop down in the depths of core CLR and if we unroll it you know 16 times then you know we get like a 2% QPS or whatever increase um, and so it's been cool to see that stuff land um, we've also been taking more and more of our performance infrastructure uh, internally and opening it up um, and starting to run it externally and that's just been leading to a bit of a you know peanut butter effect where it's not like we said oh we're going to go deep on this one area and uh, make some improvements but it's like oh we can get a little bit of a win here by just uh, increasing this and and um, that you know it's kind of a, a rising tide lifts all ships sort of thing um, where when we make you know just little improvements uh, deep in the core it's going to help a, a majority of folks um, so it'll be interesting to to run um, the same workload against RC2 and see you know how much better we've gotten. Um, awesome. And then and then as I mentioned earlier, uh, a lot of the 
performance diagnostic tools that we sort of needed have been coming online. So it's not just a, you know, previously we could be like, oh, it's slow here, and you could sort of, you know, do what I did is like have some conjecture, set some breakpoints, and you know, kind of see how often they're hit. But sort of just doing, you know, manual sampling instead of getting a trace of, you know, 30 second scenario and then diving in on, you know, where is the time being spent. So as as that performance tooling comes online, it's going to be easier for us to investigate um, performance differences and uh, regressions or just uh, hotspots and figure out how we can make improvements. Nice. Uh, time for a question for me. Is that all right? Totally. Sweet. Uh, I was just curious what your guys' thoughts are on a user configurable thread pool. Um, I mean, for us, right, like we always show all cores, um, and being able to limit the size of the thread pool so we don't have a bunch of contention based on all those cores that not necessarily can be used um, would be kind of kind of cool. I just thought I'd throw that out there. See what you guys thought. I believe that one's a map. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking here, and I'll probably say a bunch of lies and then get corrected in the comments, but uh, I, I believe that um, at least on, on the desktop CLR, that stuff is configurable. I know there's a bunch of tweaking parameters for the thread pool, and I would imagine that those are in core CLR as well. Um, I do know that with the CLI, um, there are discussions about how to um, expose knobs like this to the application um, itself. So one example not related to Threadpool is um, the GC that you're using. So we have a, a server GC and a workstation GC and certain workloads perform better under different GCs um, and that's starting to get configurable through the CLI. So I would imagine that um, if we didn't have those hooks we could add them and then once we had them we could expose them um, through the sort of hosting infrastructure in the CLI and that's just in your project.json you uh, a place to specify some knobs that uh, control configuration of, of the CLR. Awesome. Probably a good answer to me. Okay, I, I've got a bit of a random question, uh, and I don't. Yeah, I don't even know if it's a good question, but can you talk a bit about the JavaScript engine performance roadmap, specifically around ASM.js and WebAssembly? And uh, what do you think about higher level languages like C Sharp targeting WebAssembly going forward? And how do you think that'll change the roadmap of, you know, for JavaScript, I guess? You know, do you think something like WebAssembly is just a client browser thing, or will it affect Node 2 on the server? That's a really good question. Um... I'm not sure I have a good answer for you on that. Um, I would I would think that anything that can can offer you know more choice on a similar platform or on multiple platforms I guess um, would be a good thing. But I you know I just haven't I haven't read up enough on that right now to to give you a, a great answer. Yeah, I mean I know you guys don't maintain you know V8 itself. Um, yeah. We used to. <laughs> okay. Um, most of what I've heard uh, about WebAssembly and ASM.js has been focused on the client scenario. Uh, I just didn't know if there was, you know, discussion on on the server. It seems like it makes sense. Like, you know, client apps load native code all the time, like outside the browser. So wh why wouldn't it be uh, applicable to a, a Node.js app? Yeah, you know, we tend to be pretty conservative with our usage of Node and new features. Um, so we have, I, I'm not aware of any discussion down that line, but it do doesn't mean it's not there. Um, makes sense. It's kind of the difference between being a, an infrastructure cloud company and and being a uh, you know a, a front end web developer, we, we we get to make choices more like doctors than <laughs> moving fast and breaking things. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say on our team, um, you know, to a large degree, Microsoft is kind of a vertical type company as it relates to the cloud. So, um, you know, the the we're we're on the third floor in our building, 
um, the, the three of us. So the runtime and the framework is here. The, the C Sharp team is a floor below us, uh, and they're, they're on the same logical team as us. And so we kind of get influenced by that language design piece. And then um, the folks who run the Azure Cloud are just a, a building or two over. And so I guess maybe we naturally think in terms of that end-to-end -end piece. It's cool. Nice. Uh, any closing thoughts um, or closing questions from folks? I've, I've kind of run out of my, my list of about questions. Uh, no, are there any announcements that we might want to make, such as, I don't know, announcing we have a conference next week, or <laughs> we yeah, always have a conference. Yeah, absolutely. So next week, uh, many of us, not me personally, but many of us will be at the Build conference, which is, uh, is it the biggest Microsoft developer conference? It probably no. is, right? No, it's uh, not? No. Uh, the other one, um, oh, what's it called? The one that used to be TechEd, um, Ignite. Uh, oh, okay. It's a it's a developer and IT conference. Mm -hmm. It has like twenty some thousand at it. It's it's absolutely wow. it's massive. So build is intentionally smaller. Okay. So well, there are there. You can expect actually a lot of announcements uh, being made at this conference. Uh, so uh, I would I would recommend people uh, follow the the keynote next week, the keynotes actually. Um, and uh, well, even if you can't be there physically, uh, everything is going pretty much everything is going to be streamed uh, and or recorded. So uh, a lot of interesting stuff is going to happen, so something to uh, to look at next week. Um, and let me check about what, uh, what we have uh, planned, actually, for next week. Uh, next week, we are, we are going to talk about the C-sharp extension for VS Code. Oh, that, that uh, lines up with our VS Code comments earlier. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, yeah, uh, lots of new things are going to come out from uh, this extension. Uh, very exciting stuff. So, well, actually, uh, you might you might make one key point on that, which is um, there is an uh, extension store, if you will, for um, VS Code. Um, I think we maybe should put a link in the the comment, the the thing at the end. And um, there's actually several languages, some from Microsoft, some from others. You know, there's a, a Go one. Uh, the Node one just comes with it, I think. There's definitely a C Sharp one, and uh, we're seeing a lot of activity on enabling new languages with uh, VS Code. So that's actually pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Actually, the Go extension is one of the most popular uh, extensions. Okay. Is there a, a Node extension? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, Node extension, or does it just come with? JavaScript comes standard. There might be uh, an extension that brings better integration, I don't know. But out of the box, you get JavaScript, uh, yeah. debugging, IntelliSense, uh, and so on. So. All right. OK, well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, yeah, it was cool. Uh, working with you guys has been, um, and of course, you in particular, uh, has uh, been a lot of fun. Um, I, I was um, really impressed by um, the engagement that we had together, and you guys were super attentive and brought a lot to the table. Yeah, feel, feeling is definitely mutual there. I look, look forward to more, hopefully. Mm -hmm. I mean, on our side, it was all Matt, so... Uh. <laughs> no, really, really, it was uh, getting that great get repo case from, uh, from Richard that w made things super helpful. It was just like, okay, uh, you know, once you have that, and it's like, oh, I think I know where to look. It, it probably took 10 minutes to identify the issue and five minutes to prepare the PR. So it's all about just having the right test cases and scenarios and know what you're looking for, and then it's easy to get stuff done. Awesome. That's awesome. That's great. Excellent. Well, uh, thanks, everyone, for being here today. Um, this was another episode of Fun.net, and uh, we'll see you again next week. Bye, everyone.
Bye.